Hi, welcome to the next edition of Research Software Hour. Welcome. Hello, everybody. This is edition 13. 13. Hmm. Lucky us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we, we need to start yeah. up jingle, some start music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe someday we can get that professional. But anyway, what are we talking about today? Yeah, today is really exciting. I'm really looking forward. So this was a topic suggested via GitHub uh, or GitHub issues about cluster etiquette. Yes. So what does that mean? Well, what's and etiquette? Yeah, exactly. So what is what is etiquette? And what is a cluster? Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. And how do we fit in? Yeah. Do we mm -hmm. fit in? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, actually, when we were preparing for this, I was I somehow found myself on Wikipedia about etiquette, and it said, "What was the definition?" So, social norms expected in polite society, and then I thought, "Since when are we polite society?" But anyway, um, the conventional but, rules. I think it yeah. fits very well. <laughs> yeah. But I guess the point here is that it's a set of standards which allow everyone to work together well. And if you don't do these things, then other people might get annoyed at you. And that's sort of why we're here, to let you know what is considered normal and what's less normal on a computer cluster. So you can be confident if you your work makes sense there. So it's yeah. implicit rules. Mm. Yes, written or unwritten. Or right. Written. Usually unwritten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also yeah. one th interesting thing is etiquette is used to exclude people who don't follow those norms because they're lower class or lower society or something, <laughs> even when the rules aren't written. So that's what we want to avoid and make sure that everyone is able to know how to use the cluster and, well, feels yeah. confident using it. And the question that we got was uh, that would be fun to talk about like under what circumstances is it okay to use the login node and we will talk about what is a login node how mm -hmm. about interactive jobs how to turn an interactive job into a script so we will later also talk how to move a computation from the laptop to the cluster mm -hmm. or from the laptop to the cloud or from the cloud to the cluster yeah and what tools we use to develop something that eventually ends up on a Supercomputer. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about these topics. Yeah. So, well, what's a cluster? So, did someone have that HPC Carpentry image open in a web browser and can share the screen? Yes, oh. but I'm not sure my screen is nice to share. Oh. I can share it. Okay. I can probably find it here. But anyway, while you're opening that, I guess I can start trying to. This describe. is in the HackMD, uh, in the oh. internal one. Oh, yes, I can, oh, but that needs to be copied to the other picture. Yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. So can someone start describing the cluster thing? Why is the cluster thing? Yes, so for me, cluster is supercomputer. So what is a supercomputer? It's, uh, for me, uh, many computers connected together. Mm -hmm. So many boxes Yeah. with smaller boxes inside with lots of processors. Mm -hmm. But still, intrinsically, each of these is usually, in the way modern clusters are, a normal computer, more or less. So right. and less. it built, can uh, be, yes. It can, can be, yeah. I guess there are still some purpose-built computers, but what most people will use is basically a bunch of computers together. And it has a lot of network to connect it together and ways to share data and a way to schedule things. So that whenever you need to run something, you say, I need this many CPUs and this much memory. And then it goes and it finds an open spot and runs it and then saves the output for you to watch later. So why is this a benefit? 
It's usually because you can't do it on your laptop. Yeah, so you can reach more stuff than you could otherwise. And, well. Yeah, you can run, you can calc run calculations that would not fit into a laptop. Like maybe mm -hmm. you need many, many processors or you want to run many, many calculations. Right. And of course you could run, the, run them on your computer, but you would have to wait weeks, months, years. Mm -hmm. And now you can run many of them at the same time. Right, yeah. And usually it will be managed by someone else. So it exists as a service from possibly your institution or some national computing center. So you can grab it and use it that way. And did we already talk about the interconnect or did you mention not that? yet? Oh, not yet. Yeah. So what about the interconnect? Why is it? Well, sometimes they, they have, so sometimes these boxes are connected with like high speed network, but not always. Mm -hmm. So one could also build a cluster and people have done that out of, I don't know, Raspberry Pis connected with relatively mm -hmm. normal Ethernet right. cables. Yeah. And I guess that goes to what is usually meant by high performance computing in particular. So yes. that's mostly people... for me, that's mostly the communication, the network. Exactly. But maybe this is not correct. I don't know. Yeah. So in order to use all of these computers together, they have to be able to communicate very fast. And in order to do that, you need a fast network, but not just a fast network, but low latency. So that way, as soon as one computer sends something, the other one gets it, well, without very much delay. And maybe That's one more clarification. Oh, sorry. No, no, I just go on. I wanted to say it's not sufficient. You need to also to have a code that can. Yeah. <laughs> a code that <laughs> can actually. Use I mean, I can <laughs> put my serial code on a super high speed network. It won't do much. Right, yeah. And I think that's a great point because many new users who come to a supercomputer, they often expect that the code will somehow run parallel on its own and very mm -hmm. fast. And often it needs we need to do something also with the code. And the uh, uh, the other thing that I often see that new people on a supercomputer are sometimes surprised that the processors are not faster than the one that I have on the laptop. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Actually, they're often making comment, but this is much slower <laughs> than my laptop. Mm. Often it's slower. It's just many more of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're able to use them all at once. So once I had an advisor, and I wasn't there at the time, but he went to an office and said, oh, come here, come here, and he gathered all the group together and say, said, OK, I need to run this thing. So you take this and run it with these parameters. You run it with these parameters, and then send me all of the results. So that's basically what you can do on a cluster at once using some scripts. So yeah. And before we move on, maybe we should also clarify, so how does a cluster compare to the cloud? Mm -hmm. can, can one have a cluster in the cloud? Yeah. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. But what for? It depends what you want to do. Yeah, I so guess. what does, well, how would we contrast these? What would you say, Anne? To, to what? To cluster versus cloud. For me, or... uh, cloud is the uh, easiest way to get computing mm. without asking anyone. <laughs> OK. <laughs> So because like... uh, usually on the cloud you are you you can be root, mm -hmm. for instance, so mm -hmm. it means you can act, mm -hmm. uh, install anything. Yeah. So for developing, so, this is really great. Yeah. So yeah, that... also if you need it, uh, you you get the resource immediately. Like five minutes later, you can have it. And if you need three times as much, you can get three times as much. Mm -hmm. That's right. But it's only yeah. true when you have uh, you you have medium range needs. Because if mm -hmm. you really have large needs, I think you will wait for mm -hmm. quite a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess cloud, the way I it's usually see it, or it sounds like what you're doing is like the infrastructure as a service. So you're basically getting a virtual computer or a set of virtual computers yourself. Is that how you'd describe yes, cloud? Yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah. Well, on the cluster, you get 
the computers already exist and you can connect to the existing computers and then request some of the resources from there. Yes. Of course, with okay. cloud, they have ways to scale up and you can request more computers and less and adjust it that way if you need to. On the cloud, how do you parallelize stuff across multiple nodes? Do you request multiple? Same way as on a HPC. Does it have a scheduling system there or use MPI or? You can use MPI, yes. OK. So yeah, so I guess then that makes it pretty similar. Do you have to do much setup yourself to connect them together? Uh, you can, it depends from who, from where you start. Mm -hmm. If you buy it, it's, there is no need. It's already, yeah. okay. if you, if, if you request HPC cluster, mm -hmm. you have nothing to do normally. Yeah. That would be an interesting way to, mm, or an interesting demonstration for another week. Um, yes. Yeah. I think the main disadvantage uh, I see is uh, usually you are on your own mm. on the mm -hmm. cloud, which means if, if you are really new okay. uh, user, yeah. except if someone gave you um, like a, a container, mm. yeah. you can have some hard time. Yeah. Well, on the physical infrastructure, even sometimes mm. you feel it's not very flexible, you have already mm. quite a lot of software mm -hmm. and library installed and optimized yeah. for you. Yeah. And support. And, and maybe, support, yeah. Maybe one disadvantage of the cloud, but it's not like if you provision a yeah. cluster on your own and then you keep it running and you forget about it. And then <laughs> three, it three weeks later, you get the bill from. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not, uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. fewer. Uh, sometimes it's only one day after yeah. we had a, a case. <laughs> yeah. So about pricing, I asked someone on my team and assuming you use the, if you buy hardware and use it for three years, just the procurement cost is about six times the price of the cloud. And that's not including the data storage, which is in the cloud and they charge a lot for, or data transfer yes. or things like that. Um, but the real advantage there is that you can turn it on when you need it and use it and then turn it off when you don't need it. So if you need it irregularly, then it can be much cheaper. And that's why it's so commonly used these days because of the flexibility. So for, yeah. for those who connect it a bit later, so we are talking about cluster etiquette, uh, what to do and how to do things on a cluster on mm -hmm. a supercomputer. Maybe yeah. before we talk about like what to do on a login node and what is a login node and what not to do, maybe, so when should I consider moving to a cluster? So when is the moment when I decide to move my computation from, I don't know, my desktop to a supercomputer or to the cloud? Yeah. So yeah, when would that be? I guess I can start with what I usually do. So usually I start by developing there. So my data would be there and there's the uh, certain nodes I can log into and I have a console-based editor and begin doing things there. So I'll do small test runs on the login node or in the development queue and then move on. But that doesn't work for everyone. So what do you all do? What I do is usually I only use a cluster mm. when I, uh, for operational one. Mm -hmm. But I try to do everything on my laptop mm -hmm. or on the cloud. Yeah. And then when I'm ready, yeah. I move to uh, the cluster. It's like when you need to use a million CPU hours, then you move to the cluster. I don't use million CPU hours in one go. But... Yeah, well, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> something like that. Some people probably it's, do. It's more when, uh, when yeah. I have to, I go on the cluster. Right, yeah. I think okay. that's probably what people do. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have so many hours on the, on the cluster, mm -hmm. so we have to save them mm, for really uh, the most important. Right. Yeah. 
So, Radovan, what yeah. do you do? And uh, just a, a great also comment on the on HackMD, on the iceberg question, what stops you from using a cluster? Is that I would not even think of using an HPC cluster. I think so. I think many people, it's not, it's not on the yeah. radar. Mm. I think if you, if you don't know about it, mm -hmm. and I think many potential users don't even know that this is a possibility. Yeah. And then back to your question. So how, how do I use it? And when do I use it? I often do the developing on my desktop or on the laptop. Mm. Um, so all the developing testing, making sure it works. But my desktop is a, like a small, like a lunchbox, six years old, <laughs> four mm. cores. So when that is not enough, then I go to the cluster to And first, the first step is then using all processes on one node. Mm -hmm. We will talk about that, we'll mm. say what that means. And then when that is not enough, then I do MPI and I go on multiple nodes. Mm -hmm. the, the other frequent scenario is that I develop code for somebody else who, who is using the cluster. So then mm -hmm. I do development on my computer, but then I move the code to the cluster, test it there, and somebody is using it on the cluster. Mm see yeah so what other kinds of what kind of things help make it easy to develop on a cluster or not i think one of the main things is that people say don't run code on the login node which is of course true so there's one or a small number of computers you connect to to do the interactive work before you submit it to the rest of the cluster. And we if... show this uh, image, maybe you can, we can show that on the image, there was this login note, but maybe oh, you, you mentioned that yeah. already. Oh, there, yeah. So as the user, you connect to the login node and use that to submit jobs that use all of the other compute nodes, which they're all accessing the different data. And then when the job is done, it gets stored on the disks. And then you connect again, and you see the results, and then you use it. And many uh, new users on supercomputers, and here I'm speaking with one foot working in high performance computing support, is that many users think that the login node is the supercomputer. Mm -hmm. So they, they log in. And then they are on a supercomputer, then they run. And right. then two days later, they get an upset email that they have blocked the login node without no not knowing, I mean, mm -hmm. without noticing, because they ran something yeah. on the login node, which, which was not maybe meant to be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at least on our cluster, it's a fairly, like, you. we don't mind if people run a little bit on the login node. So either for a very short time to make sure the code even runs, or a small number of processors for a slightly longer time as long as not everyone's doing this at the same time. But if you use, say, all the processors for an hour, then we're definitely going to notice. And why is it a problem for? Yeah. So we can say, well, it's a problem because it may be then a problem for all the other users who are also connecting to the login node. So what they then see is that they see that their connection terminal gets incredibly slow, mm -hmm. or they may not even be able to connect. Right. And they type a command and, f and wait six seconds until it shows something, and then then they, yeah. they complain to the exactly support. that's what I want to say. We <laughs> complain and then yes. mm -hmm. they kick off for some other users. Yeah, yeah. So we got a question. Actually, we we usually check on the login node, and if we see someone, we even sometimes report. <laughs> yeah, and I thought yeah, it was like, like a, I've seen this guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we we get we get this email sometimes too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Anyway, there's a question on HackMD. Does this diagram represent a standard structure of cluster? And I'd say pretty much. I mean, yeah. there's, I mean, they have, they all have a login node and they all have a bunch of compute nodes. And then yeah. most of them will have some shared file system. So all of the nodes can access the same data. Sometimes the compute nodes have their own disk in addition, mm, so uh, which true. is then faster uh, for like faster disk access. Sometimes mm -hmm. there are more login nodes, but you, you may not notice. So sometimes there are two, three, five mm -hmm. to, um, again, to allow many users to connect. Yeah. 
But I think the login that they have uh, the home is usually a bit special, no? Depending on the cluster. And in some clusters, yes. Yeah. Well, in, um, in some clusters, it's a different file system. On on some clusters, it's the, actually the same file system. So on some clusters, it, it makes a difference uh, whether you run the calculation on the like home partition yeah. or on a scratch space. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Yeah. In fact, I can show some pictures from our cluster here, if you'd like to see. Oh, yes, we want pictures. <laughs> <laughs> OK, here we go. So these were taken with permission, and then we got permission to move them out and make them public. So let's take a look. So we have lots of these racks, and all of basically one of these rows here is one of the computers in there. And we've got, well, some other at stuff here. Um, us in the floor, fixing it up. In the back. Yeah, so here's a bunch of compute nodes in the cluster. So, well, that's a bit too much. So yeah, each of these halves here is one of the compute nodes that would have hmm, which generation are these? I think these might be the older ones. So, well, in a modern system, these would have 20 or more processors in each of these. And here you see the fast network connecting them in addition to a regular Ethernet network. And the That's lines. very obvious. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is a fast one. Oh, yeah, right. Let's see. Tons of cables. Well, you get the idea. And the green blinking lights. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. that's very important. <laughs> Let's see, that was not. Oh, we have the storage system somewhere. This is hard disk in the cluster. And there's five of these trays in our cluster. So quite a bit of stuff there. Oh, this is nice picture. <laughs> yeah. I use this to contrast data management on the cluster and data management in real life. And to point yes. out that if you aren't careful, the stuff in this disk can be just as bad as all of these files that were unsorted and got grouped into boxes and then destroyed because no one knew what they were. Anyway. Yes, that's a nice image. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Um, the, yeah. the, uh, so how much do I on the, on the login note? Mm -hmm. So something I like to say is that it, I like to use it for editing files. Mm -hmm. um, so editing run script. So editing the scripts. Maybe we will show later a script. Mm -hmm. Editing my input files. Yeah. Copying things in and out. Uh, and also short compilations, so when you need to build a code. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to use the login note. Right. A compilation, all... no? Do you compile? We tend no. to compile on the login node. On the login node? Yeah, I I do that for short compilations. For oh, even compilations. For... Actually, I like to script them. Yes. And, and not only to save the login node, but to have it documented. Mm, true. So yes, like, that's I a like good idea. I like to also uh, submit, submit the compilation to a compute node. Often the compute node has a mm -hmm. different processor than the login node. Yes. Right. And then you have everything documented, all the dependencies. So that's what I like to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Reproducible so, research. Yeah. Or forgetful me. Um, <laughs> so it's most, yeah, it's the nice mm -hmm. word is reproducible research. But uh, the <laughs> other one is that I, I log in every three weeks and then I forgot what I did three weeks ago. So mm -hmm. I like to have it in a script. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is uh, reproducible for, for yourself. Yes. Which yeah. is usually the best way to justify <laughs> reproducibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can talk. Uh, we can talk about interactive jobs. So there are these compute nodes, and on yes. these compute nodes, one runs computations. Mm -hmm. But what, what you can also do is you can reserve a compute node for interactive. Mm -hmm. use. So then you get a compute node for a certain amount of time, typically one hour, 
or a few hours. Mm -hmm. And then you can connect to that interactive compute nodes. And there I can work interactively like on my computer or like on a login node. So mm -hmm. it looks like a login node. And you can work interactively. Interactively meaning right. not scripted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so and often so then we can also discuss like when to when to do interactive stuff and when to script things. Mm -hmm. Should we do that now? Or when do we or maybe hmm. Should we do so Do you use it for debugging uh, rather than for instance? Like uh, for having the graphical interv interface for debugging? You could do it's it interactive for, not. Yes, yeah, good point. You could use it for to get a graphical interface. The other use case, and I'm not sure we talked about it before the stream or during the stream, but we talked about that sometimes you had to queue so for so long. Mm. Like you have to wait so yes. long in the a, in a queue, and I'm not even sure we talked about what the queue is. Mm -hmm. Maybe we will. Yeah, but, Not yet. Uh, Maybe we should do yeah. that first. <laughs> yeah, OK, so let's yeah. come back to interactive. Later. OK, yeah. So what's the queue? <laughs> Who wants to try for this? <laughs> That's a way to make sure you can get resources. Yeah. So There's this great picture on on uh, HPC Carpentry. Mm -hmm. that it's like a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So imagine a very busy restaurant, and you want to get a seat at the table, and then it's this extremely popular restaurant. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there is a waiting line, mm -hmm. and you wait mm -hmm. until you get a seat assigned. Oh, and, yes. Yeah. And so the seats, the I mean the chairs are the processors, mm -hmm. the tables are the nodes. Yeah. And then the queue is the waiting line. Yeah. But then, That's a good, are, uh, yeah. but then there are priorities. So you can, if you are very popular, like if you are, yes, a, yes. Uh, if you are a star, you can, star, you, get, uh, <laughs> you, can move, you can move up in the queue. Yeah, which is true yeah. anyway. But... <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, or there can be a fair share algorithm, which means that, well, in essence, the less you run, the higher your priority is. So if you run a little bit, you can get it sooner. If you run a lot, then you have to wait enough so that you get your fair share. So overall, it basically works. So the kind of parameters that go into the queue are like how many CPUs do you need? How many nodes do you need? How much memory do you need? So it can split everything up and give you the right amounts. And the, the so then there is this queue management, which is, how do you call that person in a restaurant? Is it the Metro uh, D. Metro, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So th th this queue manager tries to make sure that all CPUs are busy. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal. Right. Uh, and that the jobs don't wait too long. Mm -hmm. It also needs to make sure that there are there are jobs that need many many CPUs and jobs that need very few CPUs. Mm -hmm. Sort of to put it together like Tetris. Uh, right. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's also what uh, we show sometimes, like the Tetris. Yeah. Like, for example, if a party of eight comes in, they might need to wait for two tables to be empty next to each other. So even if there's an empty spot, you can't use it unless you'll be done before the other table is done to make the spot of eight, because the eight person has a higher priority. But you anyway. reserve only for a certain <laughs> amount of time, usually. Mm -hmm. So. You cannot stay more than two hours in your restaurant. You are exactly. kicked out. <laughs> yeah. OK, so where are we? So now we know what the queue is. Yes. Uh, so now you can come back to your uh, Yeah, now I can go back to the uh, mm -hmm. explanation is that if you need to do some programming or some debugging, mm -hmm. then it would be really boring if for, let's say, it stops after a few milliseconds this thing crashes, but you don't know why you want to debug it. And it will be really boring if every time you need to submit it, and then you wait three hours until it starts. Mm -hmm. So what you can do then is you allocate a interactive node. You get so you get a compute node for yourself for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. And in there, you can work interactively. And then you can debug quickly. So that's how, that's how I would use it. Yeah. On your clusters, are compute nodes shared among multiple people? Because ours, especially for interactive work, they're shared and oversubscribed. So we can pack people on there more efficiently. Depends on the cluster. 
So one of the two is not shared. You always get entire nodes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other cluster allows, there you can pack several people on the same node. Mm -hmm. This has advantages and disadvantages because if if it's uh, exclusive and you can also ask for exclusive nodes, then you know that there are no side effects with uh, with the uh, with the jobs of other people, right? Who may maybe they use much more memory than mm -hmm. they asked or something like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So next up was what tools do we use? So how do you usually connect to the cluster? You need from the common line. You need SSH. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, I guess we could have a whole session devoted to SSH and showing how we use it for everything. Actually, okay, yes, we could have a, with the keys. Mm -hmm. We could always ask. The keys, it. but there is also a lot that can be done with the SSH config. Mm -hmm. which yes. I didn't know for many, many years, which can make mm -hmm. the life much easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I would learn something, yes. Yeah. So what is SSH? SSH is secure shell. So it's an encrypted way to c communicate with the remote server clusters of a computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what we, I think, all use. But then it can look differently on our side. So it can either be a, a terminal, but it can also be some program that looks more graphical, but, mm -hmm. but which still talks via SSH with the cluster. Yeah. On our cluster, you can get access via Jupyter Hub which doesn't give you many resources, but at least lets you open data and do some basic computations, which is nice for usability. And usability is a great keyword here because of many users who find out that they are supposed to use the supercomputer are often, for no. the very first time, are on a terminal, and they have never seen this before. Mm -hmm. and it looks like time travel back into the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, what should we do? So, what other tools are we using? That was I wanted to ask, answer this one question, which we got to this issue is that um, how do you t how do you turn an interactive job into a script mm. which then runs on the compute node? Mm -hmm. mm. And uh, mm. I can answer how I do it. So my progression on how I get to run on really on the compute node is that I first make it work on the laptop. Mm -hmm. Just that it's like giving the right results, it's not crashing. Mm -hmm. um, then then I convert it into a script also on the laptop. So I write a bash script, mm -hmm. a shell script. And really like my number one tool is mm -hmm. the shell script for this. So I script it also on the laptop or you could write a workflow. Then I go, maybe then I go to an interactive compute node mm -hmm. and I run that script and make sure that it runs and maybe it needs some dependencies. So then mm -hmm. these dependencies need to be loaded or installed. And then the next step is to convert that shell script into a, into a job script, mm -hmm. which often means to add three, four, five lines on top, where you specify how much memory you want, how much, how many CPUs, mm -hmm. how how long it should run. Yeah. And then I run it, I debug it until it works. Once it's working, like once it's not crashing and it gives me the right result, I think the good next step, and this is what many people don't do, is to actually verify how many CPU, how many CPUs does it use, mm -hmm. how much memory does it use. Mm, yes. And does it scale? Because when I ask for memory and when I ask for CPUs, I shouldn't ask for too many, mm -hmm. because otherwise it, it maybe I'm, I will wait way too long in the in the waiting line, or I will right. be built for much more than I'm actually using. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have one oh. question, relevant because you said when you, because when we start from the laptop and you move to the cluster, and you write a script. Um, do you put like the transfer of data in the script? Mm. Because uh, you said, okay, it's like a workflow, but um, I mean, I don't know, maybe in climate, the workflow would be transferring very large files, which mm. we would not put 
in the, for instance, in a parallel job. Yeah, that's a great question. And also it will reveal that we are from different academic disciplines where, <laughs> so in my academic discipline, the, the input data is often fits into one screen. So it's kilobytes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so you can put it in your script. So you can put it, uh, yeah. it it's part of the script, but it's a great question. So on the uh, Norwegian supercomputing system, for very large data, what you need to do is you need to, so the compute nodes, these little boxes there, which actually do, do the computation, mm -hmm. they often cannot access the data store where the big data is residing. So you need to stage it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you need to do that outside of the script. And that can cause confusion. And it's right. an extra step to do. Yeah. Which is very nice when you cannot run the script in serial mode because <laughs> the cluster only allow parallel mm -hmm. jobs, mm -hmm. which happens yeah. sometimes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there is some kind of contradiction. Yeah. yeah. Which means we use so. the login node. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> so. Do you think that Git Annex, like we talked about last week, could be used for this data staging kind of process? Yeah, I was wondering. Be I mean, my... because uh, the data staging is one of the biggest problems for yeah. my community, where we mm -hmm. have large data and dependencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we don't really solve it very nicely. Yeah. We have like some wget in the scripts. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think Git Annex could be an interesting solution because even though like staging it out, staging the data outside of the script is only part of the problem. The problem is if you have a research group with 20 people mm -hmm. yes. and everybody stages the same data set right. and you yeah. fill the disk with 10 times the same mm -hmm. data set, yes. so then you want something nicer. Right, yeah. Yes. And to prevent someone from accidentally deleting the only copy of it or something like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I prepared an example of transitioning something from my desktop to the cluster. Do you think we should go over that and use that to discuss some of the remaining things? Yeah, I think it's or a good idea to illustrate you... what uh, Radovan mentioned. Yeah, OK. So I think the other people here know my example. So they can look at it. I will share my screen. And it's here. So. I have it in a Git repository on my local computer. Uh, apparently, I don't have it here. Um, so I use an alias to clone this repository here. And OK, here's my code. It's a simple Pi calculator via a Monte Carlo method. So I can use Python. And, and here you are still on your laptop, right? We are not on a supercomputer yet. Correct. Yeah, this is not anywhere. So if I run the Pi script, I see it says I give it the Python, the name of the file, and on the command line, the number of trials to do. And this is basically throwing darts inside of a square and finding how many land inside of a circle and calculating mm -hmm. pi from that. So the more numbers I give, the more accurate the pi value will be. But also the slower it gets. Mm -hmm. I mean, the longer it takes. So I can use this time command line program to see how long it takes. So this is 10 million. 10 million in 7.5. Three seconds. So remember mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And it's still not very accurate, mm -hmm. the value. Right, yeah. One, two. <laughs> okay. So are we ready to move this to the cluster? Yeah. Let's do it. Yes. Okay. So now I will SSH to the cluster, which we call Triton. So do you care about the version of Python and all the packages when you move to the cluster? So in general, I would. So this example is made so it can work on any version of Python. At least I think so. So that means that it's, well, 
I don't have to worry about it right now. But that's actually a very good point. So we would use, for example, Conda, like we talked about two weeks ago. But to... do we use Conda on a cluster? Oh, well, I would. Okay. Yeah. But I don't know, we... because we said this is we need to optimize. If... Yeah. So I guess for the many people that are doing relatively small things, Conda is a pretty good solution. <laughs> um, if you're starting to use hundreds of thousands or millions of CPU hours, then yeah, you might want to actually look at the software you run and you know, even a 10% efficiency improvement can be work or can make a big difference. And in this case, we didn't really, we didn't copy the data from your computer to the cluster, but you mm -hmm. clone it there again. Which yes. is a copy. I mean, it's like you don't have it because it's a cluster. It's completely separate. Yes, exactly. OK, so the repository has been cloned here. And this is something that I would also do. So it's all nicely packaged in Git, so I can easily move it from my computer to the cluster. And then I make some improvements here, and then I resubmit it, or I push it back to Git, and I can use it somewhere else. And bonus, you get backup. Mm, yes. True. <laughs> OK. And here we see that uh, on the command line at the beginning, we see that we are on something called login2. Mm -hmm. So oh, we, yes. are here, uh, we are here on a login node. Yes. So, let's so you have at least two login nodes. Yeah. Well, actually, <laughs> our login one has been retired long ago, and now there's okay. only login. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Actually, there's a login three now. So OK. So, so this was 7.3 seconds. Yes. Uh, did before. you time it? Uh, I have not been timing it. Let's oh. time it. Let's time. This is so slow, Richard. Mm -hmm. Why do I go on a cluster? And this is running on one CPU. One CPU. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And here we see 11 seconds. So that can be So for... let's go back to the machine. <laughs> yeah. Well, this can be for different reasons. So one reason could be that um, the login node is used by multiple people. But also, our login nodes tend to be some of the older nodes we have because we want something compiled there to be compatible with all of the different nodes on the cluster, because our cluster is very heterogeneous. But that's something that we don't need to worry about right now. So anyway, I run it here. So now I would ask, how much time in memory do we need? So let's do a quick test. I'm going to make this 10 times shorter and see, does it get 10 times faster? And it's approximately. approximately. There's some startup time of the Python process. So really, I should have made it 10 times longer. But um, we don't have time to wait for that. <laughs> Here, it's twice as long. Let's see if it works in 14 seconds. But you will have, so, anyway, some yeah. time. I mean, yeah. So then some buffer with the time. Yeah. You will not put the exact time. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's the importance of the command line interface here that we've got? So because we can run this from a command line, we can make a script that does this and submit it to the cluster. So should we do that first, or should we run it interactively first? So if we follow Radovan's uh, suggestion, mm -hmm. it was on the laptop, then it was creating the script from the laptop, and then moving. Is it, if I remember? Yeah. 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 I mean, or we go directly for the, for the JavaScript. I mean, often, mm. if, yeah. if there is no problem, and if it just works, then well, okay. let's make a run script. Yeah. Because but normally... it's good practice to have a script on your laptop, because then you can repeat it mm, again yes. and mm -hmm. again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I'll say let's create a script. Okay. 
let's run it first through the script without any extra things. Mm -hmm. No, don't put the S run, just put it normally. Just like, Python, yeah. And now yeah. let's reduce, let's reduce to... Back to 10,000. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I save the file. Yeah. And then I try running it. Yes. Yeah. Bash. Uh, that, yeah, that's the one. So it does the same thing. Oh. I called it pi and not pi. Oh, well. OK, and it works. Uh, and uh, I didn't time it, but I'll just assume it takes the same amount of time. Yeah. So now we want to submit this. Is that the case? Yes. OK. Oh, you don't parallelize first. Mm -hmm. Should we parallelize first? I don't know. Mm -hmm. What would you do? No, yeah, I would I would probably test it first, uh, if I can, on the cluster, yeah. on the same amount of process. I mean, I would One. feel uncomfortable doing that on a login node. Yeah, because already really? then you are using more in many many. Oh, it's CPUs. two. We can yeah. use two common. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's try it. So submit pi, and I'm going to tell it it should use two threads to do these ten thousand calculations. So Radovan, how do you develop to parallelize? Because you say we cannot test it on the login node. So where where do we where should we develop it? So then and I would test it, it. On either an interactive node, mm -hmm. or I would test it on, on the laptop. Yeah. But never on the login node. Yeah. It's I not would, good. I, I uh, wouldn't, but I mean, it's yeah. OK here. It's a few seconds. Yeah. I guess the rule of thumb that I'll tell people is if it takes less than one CPU hour, then people usually wouldn't notice. So. For example, you can use one CPU for one hour, and well, one out of 20 is small, and people are sort of always doing that. Um, you would use 20 CPUs for three minutes, and that will be a little bit annoying to other people, but it will be done so fast that, well, you know, people sort of deal with it. Um, but maybe that is sort of a bit too much. There's a good question on HackMD, the Slurm extension. So that extension doesn't really mean anything. So it just reminds me that this is going to be a Slurm script rather than a regular batch, batch script. And Slurm is the queue manager we're using here, the thing that does the scheduling on all of the nodes. So that's your own convention yeah. to recognize all the scripts. Mm -hmm. How do you call them? Um dot batch. Mm. I call them run.sh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, I've seen that, and yes. In other cases, I'll also use an sh file, I mean, whatever. <laughs> OK, so here we are. Let's take it back to this, and let's and submit it. Did we comment on that it was almost twice it took? Uh, did we comment on that, on the timing at all? No. So, yeah, so, so here. It, was, it, was, uh, it took less time. It took mm -hmm. seven seconds instead of. Uh, yeah. Wait a moment. Yeah. Yes. It took seven That's seconds yes. instead of 11. Yeah. So it did go faster yeah. by using two. OK, so here we are. So now we add some magic commands in the top to tell it to, to tell it how we want to run this. Actually, on our cluster, everything will be automatically detected. So we don't really need to do much. But let's do it anyway for clarity. So we want one CPU. And what else do we need? Uh, how much memory does this use? Should we do a quick memory profile? So one little trick. Actually, how would you find the amount of memory a program uses? I know so the I trick that I use. I admit that what I do is I ask, I start with asking for as much as is on the mm. on the CPU, so mm -hmm. typically two gigabyte yeah. or one gigabyte, and then I reduce it until it doesn't work. So that's mm -hmm. the like the that's the most naive but simplest way. But yeah. there, are, I mean, the better way is to to <laughs> use some profiler. We can look at it. Yeah, yeah. but I I, I do the same. Way. Yeah, that's the, <laughs> that's also what I recommend. Just overestimate and then see how much it actually uses, and then reduce it down. 
but I want to try don't forget system. to reduce it. That's the only thing because sometimes I, I, I forget. I mean, it's not even intentional. But, uh, so once I learned this trick, user bin time dash v. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yes, that's good. Says, yeah, I learned that very recently. I don't know that. And it, it works only with USR bin time, not with time itself mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. interesting reason. Yeah. So here it's running um, and it says command being timed bash slurm pi dot slurm. It took us 11 seconds. And if we scroll down, it should say maximum resident set size kilobytes. Yeah, that's cool. 10,000, which means that this program took about 10 megabytes of memory. And why should one not ask for too much? Because then you may either sit longer in the queue mm. or you may get a build. So there is like the CPU billing, mm. sometimes like in this virtual, mm -hmm. uh, you may get built more than you use because yeah. uh, I may occupy more processors because every processor comes with a certain amount of memory. Mm -hmm. If I ask for a lot more memory than is on one processor, other processes will be blocked and I like pay for them. Right. While yeah. Not using them. Mm -hmm. Then or maybe, oh, re oh, sorry, just reason three is that uh, I I prevent other people from yeah. using the resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's probably the best reason Yeah. to try to. I mean, and I didn't know this common actually because it's mm -hmm. one of the most difficult things to estimate the memory. Yeah, I only learned this recently too, but. You know, there's actually a lot of interesting information here about what, like, file system access and so on. But anyway, so anyway, 10 megabytes of memory is absolutely tiny. So on our cluster, the default amount of memory is 500 megabytes. So, so how do you know that as a user? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I guess if you submit a job that doesn't say an amount of memory, then it will, you can look and see how much it actually reserved. Actually, let's do it that way. So this is how you would tell it to use a certain amount of memory. I'm just going to comment that thing out. And these two, the two hashes, they will have the effect that that line will be ignored. Mm -hmm. So the first line will not be ignored. And how about we ask immediately for two cores? Why, why only one? Um, yes. I guess we could. Because we have like in principle five minutes left. Of okay. We can go a bit over time, but yeah. Threads. Should we say we want two threads here? Okay. Yes. So there's something I did here which says s run, and that basically lets us time this a little bit better. So I save the file and let's submit it. We submit it with s batch. Uh, does everything look good? That was good. Yes. Yeah. So on our cluster, there is a special command, slurm q, which will show the jobs that I have submitted. So I see it's not here, which means it has already finished. So I can do slurm history. This here is a Jupyter server I have running via Jupyter Hub. If I do slurm history, I see uh, here. So the job number was this. It was called submit pi.slurm. This needs to be a bit wider. That's a little bit better. Yeah, I guess that works. And we see that the requested, requested memory was yeah. 500 megabytes. So that's the default amount of memory. Mm -hmm. So that's and, how a user can see it. Yeah. And it took about nine CPU seconds, but the actual wall time, real time it took was five seconds. So we see it was using two CPUs. Another thing I would do is run SF. SEFF on the job ID, and it tells me mm, the efficiency of the job. 
But so it's a custom thing on that cluster? I think it's a default storm thing. Okay. I didn't know. I don't know that one. I didn't know. Yeah, I figured it out. Oh, I think it's, I remember now. It's, I think it's an extension, but it's mm. a Slurm extension. Yeah, like, I think it's a Perl script or something like that, mm. which it's, a, anyway. So we see it set 100% efficiency, which seems a bit much to me, <laughs> of 10 seconds. I guess it's because it rounds to the nearest second. So it used 10 core seconds with five mm. wall seconds. It's too small, maybe. You know? Yeah, this is a little bit too small. And memory utilized was two megabytes. But it's still really good to look at that. And also to, mm -hmm. so we looked at the memory, yeah. but the next thing one should verify is, did I ask for the right amount of CPUs? Yeah. And one way to find out is to ask for twice as many, twice as many, twice as many, and check mm -hmm. the timing. Right. And to also not expect that this will be get better and better all the time. And mm -hmm. the other way is to look at the output of this Ceph, because one problem that we often see in uh, in support is that people inherit job scripts from their colleagues from yes. from mm -hmm. postdocs from past generations so they they get a job script and they adapt it then until it works but they don't mm -hmm. change parameters because may maybe they don't know what they mean yeah and run with asking for too few cpus too many cpus too much memory so yeah. this is something that i would always I'll recommend to verify, right. of course, not for every single calculation. Like once, if I want to run 200 similar calculations, I only need to verify that once. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then I can run all my 200 calculations with the same settings. Yeah. But this is something often never done, unfortunately. Yeah. And we have the self command on the no vision. <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay. a super nice command, I think, for yeah. users, honestly. OK. So here we see the slurm, or well, when we submit in this batch job, where's the output? Like, where's the answer to pi? So by default, it saves it to this file called slurm and the job ID dot l. And if I open this, I see the output here. So it says calculating pi via that much, two threads, and the value of pi. So. What next? Mm. So we have not too many minutes left. Yeah. But one thing I wanted to talk about was how to report problems. But maybe we are not there yet. Let's see whether we forgot anything yeah. else. How about? I don't know. Did we want to talk about data on the cluster or? I guess talking about data would be an interesting thing. Maybe we can go a little bit over time. Yeah. I guess we could also, what if we had another day where we talked about, we basically started from the Slurm script again, and we did it, and then we looked at all the ways to like run it as an array job, run it with multiple mm -hmm. nodes, and things like that, and combining the data. So we make this episode be more about the Y cluster and another one about how. Sounds good. Would. Like your data, yes. I think it would be very interesting to, yeah. to show. And then that can be the manual for doing the... Mm, How to parallelize your code with no effort. Yeah. Well... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, yeah, it's yeah. this area of jobs is, is, is incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, just clarifying a question here on HackMD. Mm -hmm. So the question was... Um, you ran this Python script first on the login node, and it took like 11 seconds. But then we converted it to this Slurm bash script, and we put it on a queue, and then we waited until you got the resources, which took immediately, and mm -hmm. then it took six seconds. But this was mm -hmm. uh, this was because we ran on two cores. Yeah. And that's because but, the code uh, is yeah. developed to be able to run on several yeah. cores. Yeah. So if we we could ask for four cores, and probably it would take three seconds. Uh, but it was not. It was not because because he got the dedicated compute resources. I'm not even sure whether yeah. you got the node for yourself or whether you were on the node with other people. Yeah. I probably did not get it for myself, but also. Um, Mm -hmm. 
but also it did run on one of our newest compute nodes. So that processor probably actually was faster than the login mm -hmm. node amount. But you, you run, yeah, 11 second was with one core. Yeah. So here I've doubled the time to mm, 20,000 iterations. And the total mm -hmm. time it took was 19 seconds. So that was a little bit faster than the login node, even though okay. it was shared. Yeah. And it took a total of 10 real seconds to do that. But you uh, may wait for several yeah, minutes. You I mean, your cluster is very nice. Yeah. You don't have to wait. Yeah. Because right now I haven't run a lot of stuff myself, so I have a very high priority. Ah, yes. And, <laughs> and also, also our cluster divides to short and long things. So if I just submit it, it will automatically, if it takes, actually it didn't set a time limit here. So we see that the time limit. So that's the default time limit, which is probably small. Yeah, the default mm -hmm. time limit is 15 minutes, so it can run it almost anywhere. Yeah. That's another reason to adjust time mm -hmm. in addition yeah. to memory yeah and, or we should not ask for way too much time why not because then again the, because the scheduler has no idea that mm -hmm. this this job will finish earlier so it, it you may yeah. wait longer in the queue but i shouldn't mm -hmm. ask for too little time either so if, if i ask for less than this then the job will take mm -hmm. it will get yes. killed it will get stopped yeah that's right so how do you do that uh, like for the memory uh, rather mm -hmm. than yeah by it's... dichotomy or <laughs> Yes, and and adding a little bit more, like adding twenty yes. percent, just in case. Yeah. If you if you have a job that is running for a week, and you think that it will just barely not make it, then mm -hmm. it would be of course pity if it gets stopped after a week. Mm -hmm. So then you can often you can write to the support and ask, well, you know, I have this thing, it will probably time out. Can you please extend it? And mm -hmm. they will normally do it. Yeah. Yeah. Should we talk okay. about reporting problems? Do we have time? Yeah, let's um, do that. I think that's, that's, that's already what you have started. Really good. Yeah. Yes. Because... yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think there are a few things I wanted to say. And really briefly, one is to not hesitate to ask for advice. Mm -hmm. So if you have a script and you are unsure, like this thing that I'm doing right now, is this a good idea? Mm -hmm. I mean, write to the support and ask them whether what they think about it. Uh, curiously, we never get this question. <laughs> I think people just try it out until it produces some numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so please ask. I think people will be really happy to to answer and help out. Also, if you are unsure, like yeah. is this running on a login node or is this running on a compute node, mm -hmm. don't hesitate to ask. Yeah. Um, I think we fair to ask. People yeah. are sometimes scared to ask. Yeah, yeah, and I understand that. I understand that, but and also connecting to like, I think everybody inherits these scripts from somebody else. Mm -hmm. yes. But please verify these parameters. And if you are unsure on how to how to find out, like you can say, I'm unsure how to find out how much memory. Mm -hmm. Write to the support; they will they will help you out. Yeah. Then a few more a few more uh, and tips. I guess there's yeah. also a good way to ask for help and a not so good way. So, <laughs> if some if you write and say exactly. it doesn't work, what do I do? Then they'll say, hmm, Well, I don't know because you haven't told me anything about what you've done. I think that's what Radovan's about to Precisely. talk about yes. now. So how but I, you... I think for some users, because I, I had to say, I have many emails like that uh, for day to day support, and they say this is just to initiate a conversation. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to help me? And they say, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> yeah, it's much easier if you give, give me more information. But they mm -hmm. don't even know what to do. Right, yeah. yeah. What should uh, you give if you are stuck on yeah. a cluster? What, what are the most important things yeah. would have so I, I think most important is that um, that you first maybe maybe before the before you report the problem that you try to maybe isolate what the problem might be mm -hmm. maybe try to make that problem smaller an example an example is that we, I, we often get an email that here something crashed and mm -hmm. then then we get the email so here is here is what i see this is crashing call but, dump yeah <laughs> but i don't even know it would be nice to know like has this ever worked before or is mm -hmm. this have you tried it for the first time 
it's just to know like is this maybe something wrong on the computer or is yeah. there something wrong in the script or in the code so mm -hmm. that information is often missing then the other information that is often missing is that we get this then then there is no example it's just an information like my job crashes okay so then where is the job and can you please give me the script and aha there is a script can you give me the input files mm -hmm. all the dependencies so maybe right. the dependencies are not in the script maybe they are in the bash rc mm -hmm. so after a lot, of, a lot of back and forth 10 emails back and forth we find out what is the script and the script is asking for 40 nodes five days mm -hmm. Which means that, uh, like, as a as a support, I cannot really help here because I know that if I submit it to the queue, I will also wait two days until this is even starting. Mm -hmm. So then, my next question is often, okay, the problem that you see, how far into the calculation does it happen? And then mm -hmm. we find out, and we are already seventeen emails in. We find out that <laughs> it crashes after a few milliseconds, mm -hmm. but the job script is asking for forty hours. <laughs> So then we, yeah. so, so after a lot of back and forth, we, we make this problem smaller right? because mm -hmm. the smaller the problem is and the more self-contained yeah. and the more isolated, the easier it is also to help out. Mm -hmm. But here, I mean, this is uh, really something super useful for someone who has never even debugged a code because yes. you are yeah. nearly debugging with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I understand that uh, because to ask these like right questions, uh, right in quotes, um, it, mm -hmm. it it takes some experience in debugging. Yeah, yeah because you have the, me I mean, the methodology you described yeah. is, uh, I think for a new um, user, it's, it's not so obvious. No, mm -hmm. what I also mm -hmm. like to often ask is, please tell me step by step what I need to type so that I see the same problem as you. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, that's like, right. Log into the machine, then I did this, yeah. then I did module load, then I ran the script. Mm -hmm. That's why you will always write the script rather than. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I wanted to mention one more thing, and that is this XY problem, which we also, also see very often <laughs> that uh, the user wants to do something, and let's call it X, but fails, at, it doesn't work. So then the user tries to solve it, finds on the internet that solution Y is being suggested. So the user tries the solution Y, solution Y fails as well. Then user gets frustrated, sends an email to support, reporting a problem with solution Y. Then we there is a lot of back and forth and debugging. And then after a while, we find out that at, after a while, we find out what was the actual problem X that the user really wanted to do. but no, Which is not solved. <laughs> Which is not solved, <laughs> and then we find out that that this solution Y wasn't even a good solution. So we we have been debugging kind of the the wrong thing. So what did I want to say with that? Mm -hmm. Like when you report a problem, also maybe mention what do you have in mind? What it what is it that you really want to do at the end? Mm -hmm. uh, not only this, uh, not only the error message, but at, like at the end of yeah. the day, I wanted to do this and this and this because maybe mm -hmm. there is a better way. Like yes, that's I a run. very good point. Yeah. 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 And I've sort of, for our users, tried to reduce it down to three questions that should be answered for every support request. So first was, what are you trying to accomplish? The ultimate goal, not the current technical obstacle, which is the XY problem. And then, has it ever worked? And if so, what has changed? So for example, has it worked on your computer? Has it worked a week ago? Did it work with fewer cores or whatever? Then finally is what did you do and make it reproducible? So basically. So do you have a, some yeah. kind of templates for your request when you submit requests? Well, because I have seen many uh, yeah. HPC center, you need to follow, you, you even have a form. Yeah. Not exactly a template, but I made this page, which I just put in HackMD, that shows these three, three things here. And then the places to ask for help. So when I get a request which I don't know what to do, I'll direct them here and ask for a little bit more information. 
And yeah, this how to write good support request is what inspired me to make this. And actually, yeah, I've it even links there. Hmm, I have the wrong link. Yeah. So there's the short and long version there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, I guess we're 10 minutes over the scheduled time, which is normal, because who's going to constrict us anyway? <laughs> uh, and it sounds like we have an idea for next time. Which so, is with uh, this data job array you want to do? Yeah, or, you know, like take an MPI code, open MP code, this code, show how you can do it as a job array, or like how I would make the script so it uses the slurm variables in order to report the, um, like, use slurm variables so I can adjust the slurm script and not have to adjust the other code in there. So basically a lot of other best practices. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah and then we could also, um, again, show how can I, how can we find out how many CPUs we use, mm -hmm. how is the scaling would be. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I think it would be very interesting. A good to scaling see, like example. Scaling. Yeah. yeah. Should we do this next week then? Yes. Okay, sounds good. We've got the plan. Sounds good to me. And I think I have one more question, but we will not answer it. But I wanted everybody who listens mm -hmm. to think about it. And that is, okay, we talked about how, how users should adapt to supercomputers. Mm -hmm. But uh, so should users adapt to supercomputers or should supercomputers adapt to users? I would really love to hear your opinions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or maybe we also yeah. use it as an icebreaker for next week. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my answer is it should mm -hmm. adapt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both. I mean, we need user needs to adapt, but also supercomputer needs to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we all three agree. Mm -hmm. We need to do a lot to make things more accessible and usable. Yeah. Okay. Well. Super. Thanks so great. much for watching and listening. Yeah. Thanks. So see you next week. Thanks you. Bye. Thanks. Um, thanks, Richard.